This episode is brought to you in part by the American Homebrewers Association, a not-for-profit organization that helps beer lovers like you save money on beer and brewing supplies at over 2,000 breweries and homebrew supply shops around the country. Visit homebrewersassociation.org to learn more about their member deals program. Homebrewersassociation.org. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, March 28th, 2019. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, hop sampler number eight. Steve and I taste three small batches brewed with Motueka, Rakao, and Nelson Savon. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows, our DVDs, our brewer's logbooks, and other basic brewing gear, including our tie-dye silicone pint and our brewing rainbow shirt. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, at Basic Brewing, and find our show page on Facebook as well. We have a cool Basic Brewing app on iTunes and Amazon.com, and we're found all over the place where fine podcasts are served up. And if you do us the, say, uh, the favor of rating us on iTunes and maybe leaving a nice comment there, they say that that will help new listeners to find us. If you want to support us financially, check out Patreon.com slash Basic Brewing. And thanks to everybody who's helping out. If you go to Patreon.com slash Basic Brewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. I'm uh, recording this episode in advance uh, because my family and I are off on spring break as uh, this is being posted. You might have noticed that this week's hop sampler is based on hops from New Zealand. I was lucky enough to attend the homebrew conference in Nelson, New Zealand three years ago, and um, I fell in love with the place. The land is beautiful and the people are welcoming and friendly. So it broke my heart when I heard of the horrific events in Christchurch recently. Uh, we didn't get to visit that city while we were there, but I'm sure I'd love it, too. Um, I don't know what to say other than uh, I'm thinking of our friends in New Zealand. Uh, no easy way to transition from the tragic to the frivolous, but um, let's try with this email from listener Frank. Frank says, I've seen a couple of your videos and have listened to the podcasts where you use cereal as an adjunct in beer. My club, Clarksville Carboys, has an upcoming event and want to brew Fruity Pebbles New England IPA. But I'm not sure where in the process would give me the flavor that I want. I know I can put it in the mash, but what about adding it to the secondary? Well, thanks, Frank. Uh, even though breakfast cereals are pre-gelatinized, you know, they're already cooked, so you don't have to cook them when you use them in beer, uh, they still have unconverted starches, so I think you'd want to put them in the mash to convert those starches into sugar. However, you know, I don't know what would happen for sure if you put cereal into the secondary. Not something I'd want to risk a full volume batch for, though. Uh, if uh, if it were a cereal with marshmallows, you could separate the marshmallows out and put them into the secondary, I think, since they're basically mostly sugar. Um I know all the purists out there are cringing at this whole discussion. <laughs> a New England IPA with breakfast cereal breaks so many rules. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'd, I'd try a sample of it at, at club night, for example, for sure. Speaking of club night, I'm assuming you're already registered for HomebrewCon in June. That'll be here before we know it. Uh, time for a quick word from our sponsors. And friends, Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa. I get an email from High Gravity a few days ago announcing new quantity discount pricing on High Gravity's ingredient kits. You can save 10 bucks when you buy two and $20 with a purchase of three or more. No word on how long this will last, so head on over to highgravitybrew.com and check out all the details on that. You can check out what they have to offer in kits, including 20-pound goose English IPA, 40-pound goose English barley wine, and the first from High Gravity's Classic Style Series, Dry Stout. They had, have a ton of kits, uh, many of them based on beers served at Pippin's Tap Room, which adjoins the shop in Tulsa and is worth a visit, And because I, I can tell you everything there on tap is delicious. And those beers are brewed with a Warthog Electric Brewing System made right there at High Gravity. High Gravity's electric systems take the pain out of propane. The pain out of propane. Single to three vessel configurations from five gallons all the way up to two barrels. 
And if you watch Basic Brewing Video, you've seen mine, and I love it. Check out all the options at highgravitybrew.com and use the promo code EBC75BB. That's EBC75BB to save 75 bucks off your electric gear purchase. That's at highgravitybrew.com. Okay, this hop sampler is a little more complicated. Uh, I noticed that uh, this batch had a lack of head retention. So I suspect that that may have been the result of a contamination with something, either, you know, some kind of weird bug or or wild yeast or something. So I headed into this tasting with a little bit of a trepidation. So what will happen? We go back in time a few weeks ago with Steve Wilkes in the studio. Steve Wilkes, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks, James. We just shot two video episodes, and now we're up here tasting uh, tasting hops. Yeah, you left Susan downstairs to skin the episodes. We shot them. <laughs> She's got to clean them. We field dressed them, so, you know. <laughs> it's okay. Now, we're, we've headed down to a New Zealand uh, with this one, and that's the, that's the only time I'll attempt the accent. Uh, we have Motueka. Rakao and Nelson. Is it Savin or Savon? I say Savin. I don't know if I'm right, but that's how I say it. It's a wine term, right? Well, Sauvignon, like Sauvignon Blanc. So, yeah, I guess. Never thought about it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, Savin is how I would say it. Okay. Sauvignon. Uh, so we have Motueka, Rakao, and Savin. Nelson Savin. From Nelson, where, where I've been. I've actually seen... Hops like these uh, harvested. Wow. Yeah. Well, there's a video out there on the on Basic Brewing Video. You ever watch Basic Brewing Video? <laughs> no, I never heard of it. <laughs> you only watch the shows that you're on. That's right. <laughs> so we've done the hop sampler. This is a little different because we're using Brees Vienna dry malt extract. as a, We're usually using the Pilsner light dry malt extract. This is with a Vienna, and so it's a little it's a little darker. Uh, it's more how would you dark deep copper? Is that what you would call it? Uh, I wouldn't call it a deep copper. I'd, um, but yeah, it's, it goes to copper, maybe with just a hint of redness in the <laughs> copper with a hint of red. I don't know. I had a hint of redness, but I got an ointment. <laughs> That's right. Well, I'm glad. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna take a picture here real quick. Uh, pause for for uh, for social media. There we go. Um, for them, for these are all consumed. Um, so okay, now here's some background. First of all, we we sent these samples off to uh, to David Curtis up at at Bell's Brewery uh, to have uh, their lab up there do some analysis, some IBU analysis. So we're actually going to have some numbers wow. on some actually li- actual lab measured IBUs on this thing. It's not just me, you know, talking out of my hat or whatever I do about hop stand bittering units <laughs> out of your tinseth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking out of my tinseth. <laughs> So, uh, so there's that. Yeah. Then also, I've noticed, I, on this batch, the head retention is just like nothing. The head just goes away. It's balder than I am. <laughs> it's catching up. <laughs> there's, there's nothing. There's nothing going on up there. So, I think that I've got, I think that I I've got a little con- contamination of some sort in. In my system, whether it's in my hose or my uh, my uh, bottling wand or my, or my little uh, my, my little auto siphon, so I went to your shop and I bought all new that. And I also, while I was at it, I bought a new bottling bucket and, and oh, spigot. Yeah, because yeah. you know I don't want to risk having some kind of weird thing ruin my beers. So you know, so that these these beers are. Uh, headless. <laughs> it's the it's the Marie Antoinette flight. Uh, <laughs> Ooh. Too soon. Yeah, too soon. <laughs> so, uh, but do you do you taste anything off or nasty? 
I don't taste anything off on the beers at all. They do, they don't taste infected. They don't taste well spoiled, for lack of a better word. They're not accidentally sour or accidentally barnyardy. It, it, you know, um, they're very effervescent. Mm. So you look at them and you think they're flat. They're definitely not flat. So there's, but there's no head retention at all, which is just weird. So, you know, maybe if there's extra carbonation and there's no head retention, you know, that may be, you know, the, the extra carbonation may also be an indication that there's something else going on there that we're not anticipating. Well, I wondered about that. And sometimes, you know, with, with infections, they take a while to express themselves. Mm -hmm. So you can have a beer that's very fresh and infected, but whatever bug is in there hasn't done its work yet. And so you might get away with it. You drink it real fast. But if it sits around for two or three months, and then you open that sucker up, well, it might blow up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or you get a gusher or whatever. But that, but yeah. that's what will happen a lot of times. And, um, you know, customers are bring a beer and what's wrong? And, well, there's nothing. You can tell there's a little something weird, but it, you guys are like, well, drink it now. <laughs> <laughs> drink everything fresh. Drink, drink it really fresh. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I sent I sent these beers up to uh, t- set two sent two sets of samples up to David at Bell's, and he tasted one, and he sent me an email and said, "I hate to tell you, but I think this one has diacetyl." Uh, so I'm not I'm not tasting diacetyl. I don't get that at all. I'm not getting a, getting a buttery or a butterscotch flavor. So I just maybe I sent him one that was just extra contaminated. <laughs> <laughs> you need to invest in that bottle washer I've been trying to get you to buy. <laughs> I swear I don't make. I swear I don't make contaminated beers. You could, you could tell me, tell me true, Steve. Do I do I usually may serve you contaminated beers? No, James never serves me contaminated beers. He saves those for the other guys. But uh, no, this is. We're not even sure that's the case here, but it probably but, is. But just in case, yeah. Uh, so, so all that all that to preface what. Uh, what we have here so it's interesting because this flight you know i was expecting this has a higher hsbu uh number Uh than any of the other ones since we've been measuring hsbus and i guess i should back up and talk about the for those of who new to the new to the podcast new to the hop sampler this is our eighth one. What I do on these things I, is I take one pound or 450 grams of malt, dry malt extract, and I put that in three quarts or three liters of water, and I bring it just up to the boil. You know, the water starts to bubble, and it's usually like 290 degrees Fahrenheit on my thermometer here at this altitude. Then I shut off the uh, heat. I put in the hops and I set it aside for 30 minutes off the heat and then I chill it down in an ice bath and I pitch 3 grams of uh, Safel USO5 Mm -hmm. and ferment and then bottle using one carbonation drop per bottle. So that's that. Um, So in this batch I used a full ounce of Motueka, which is 6.5% alpha acid. And then uh, Rakao and Nelson Sauvin have higher alpha acid levels, so I pitch those proportionately uh, after that. So I have 17 grams of Rakao at 10.6% alpha acid and 16 grams of Nelson Sauvin at 11.6% alpha acid. And the way I figure uh, HSBUs is I take the alpha acid percentage, I multiply it times the weight in ounce, I take the product of that, I divide it by the volume, in this case, three quarts, or 0.75 gallons. And that's, that's where I come up with the uh, HSBUs. And, and if you haven't heard it, go back a couple of episodes and listen to the, epi- the episode with uh david curtis of bells where we actually have six or five beers where we have you know figured out this hsbu and they're also lab results so we actually have i 
IBU, measured IBU numbers on those beers. So um, it's an interesting concept. And it's this, uh, the reason I, <clears throat> that, I, that I made this so high is because I wanted to see if we could reach a bitterness level that we find too bitter. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, these are not too bitter, but, but they're moving in that direction. Mm-hmm. For me, yeah, they they've all got a substantial, uh, very bitter back backbone to them. Mm-hmm. Um, not undrinkable beers. I do have a favorite, which I won't mention at the moment. I am getting different hop character from each beer, but it's much more subdued than I was expecting. Um, have no idea if that has to do with the head retention problem that we've already discussed. If it has to do with the Vienna malt perhaps being a little more assertive and so therefore hiding the hop character a little bit. Um, the bitterness levels in all three of these, or between the three of them, I think are very similar. So it tells me that the formula that you're using, again, is correct, meaning we're, we're shooting for kind of a level playing field in terms of its perceived bitterness, and we definitely. You definitely got that accomplished. Mm. Um, and uh, again, there are differences in these, uh, but I'm with you. I almost want to go back and do this again with the Pilsner malt, just because we've right. had so much uh, success in the in in really tasting the, malt, the hop character. These these are much more subdued. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the the malt backbone to me is is a little more caramely. Definitely. You know, in the other ones, it was like nice and bright and clean, and the the malt, while it was present, it didn't get in the way. Uh huh. Yeah, I agree with that. This is, um, I you know what I was hoping for was kind of a more real world beer a little bit, mm. and that may be what we got, but um, but I do think that that going forward we we probably want to stay with the Pilsner. <clears throat> These don't taste bad. But they're not delightful, you know. In the past, we've we've been like, "Well, oh, I'd drink that," you know. It's like, oh, good Lord, you know, a pound of DME and an ounce of Cascade, and you're got two legs in the air, and you're happy. <laughs> 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 but uh, but these not so much. Yeah, I'd be interested to do it again with these hops, just to see. Uh, and of course, I'd like to change the variable of the of the. Uh, extract just to see get back to our baseline Mm -hmm. Uh, and tasting these as they're warming up they're maybe maybe there is there is there a a little plasticky are you detecting a little plasticky flavor coming through now a little bit as soon as you said that word i was like yeah 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 so, um, may, so maybe there is some kind of a contamination going on here. So we'll probably, I do want to do a redo because, uh, you know, I want to see if we can get the foam back in my world. <laughs> and we did, uh, we did taste uh, my, my Brett uh, golden ale, uh, which did have, you know, a, a head on it. And my, right. my uh, two hearted clone, which is coming out of the keg, yep. which definitely has a good head on it. And yeah. it sticks around forever. You could shave with that. So, yep. Uh, you know, my world is not completely ruined, but <laughs> by this thing, which to me, uh, and and I and I and I did these beers before I did the Brett beer, so I think okay. <laughs> so it's not Brett. I think we could definitely taste it if it were a Brett uh, contamination, but that's not. There's not Brett. This is, this doesn't t- taste like Brett. Um, so I guess we could just go ahead and 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 proceed as we normally do. Sure. Uh, just talking about these beers and and you know it's a it's a learning what do they say a teaching moment you yeah. know that that it's not it's not what you, it's not never having an issue with your process but it's what you do when you do find an issue with your process and being able to identify it. sure yeah absolutely well again the the beers are are not they really don't taste off to me they're just um, the, the hop character is not as present as I was expecting, and I, and again, I don't know if that's because of the malt. 
Mm-hmm. Um, the Malt character comes through pretty strongly. Gosh, I, you know, I just I'm kind of out of adjectives for it. I think that I think that the um, I think I was just expecting brighter, juicier hop flavor, mm-hmm. and they're yeah. just kind of bitter. Yeah, to me, they're just they're just bitter. Yeah, usually we're just like, oh my god, fruit salad and citrus and grapefruit, and we're just like bowled over, mm-hmm. you know, by the character of the of the hops, and and especially with the amount of of alpha acids that are in the <laughs> the amount of hop stuff right. that that are in these beers, we should just be, you know, bowled over by these things. Well, of the three, one of them actually has a pretty good hot bouquet to me none of them have the big hot bouquets that i was kind of expecting and um and i've brewed with all three of these hops before so i have some sense of what they what they can be like you know what they're mm-hmm. like successfully though i you know you can't remember that from moment to moment necessarily but i but i have used all three and been very happy with the results we use uh the matoika in our new england ipa that that my son and I have brewed and mm-hmm. we don't sell it as a kid or anything, but just, it's just our recipe. And we used a lot of Matoika in it and it was great. And it was big and juicy and, you know, had tons of layers of hop flavor. And I don't, I was expecting that and I'm not getting it. This is, this is going to be posted the last week of uh, March. So have you thought of your, what you talking about kits? Have you thought of your, your, your kid of the month for April? No. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe by the end of the show you'll you'll uh, think of it. Well, I, yeah, I've been trying to think about, you know, summer brewing, spring brewing and actually now that you mention it, I'll announce it right now. Okay. Cuz cuz I did have a thought today about it. I think the it's not going to be the the beer kit of the month, it'll be the beer collection of kits for the month. The Lawnmower series pale ales. So we start off they're they're dedicated to lawn they're lawnmower beers. Mhm. Except we have the push more blonde, which is light, easy to move. Then you've got the lawn tractor pale ale. If your lawn's a little bit thicker, you'll need this beer. Then we move up to the zero turn IPA. It's for those difficult to reach places. And finally, if you live somewhere like I do, you'll want the brush hog double IPA. <laughs> To cure those those uh, vines and uh, nettles that are in your pasture. So are those going to be on special in April? They're going to be on special. I'm going to put them all at 25% off. Oh, my God. Yeah, and you can get, uh, you know, I'm trying to get all the beers written as all grain and extract and some of them as partial mash. Um, I'll try to have them all in all those formats by then. Right now, I think they're all just in extract beers, but mm. there's they're, but they're easy to to make you know they're all recipes i've made for years and uh, they're really nice beers they're really nice american Mm -hmm. straight ahead american pale ales Mm -hmm. they just they're the same family of beers so they go from little baby beer to really big (laughs) beer and they're and they're very tasty so that'll be the the beer of the month there you go at steve's brew shop dot com all right so what do you think what what are your thoughts on beer number one hang on The um, the hop flavor is a little bit a little bit juicy. Mm-hmm. I get a little bit of a kind of a juicy fruit gum flavor from it, just ever so slightly. Um, it's not unpleasant. I do wish it had a head, but that's not what we're talking about. And actually, the beer is not unpleasant. Um, mm-hmm. It's kind of one dimensional. Again, not really the purpose of the exercise, but so different from the previous ones. Mm-hmm. I, I, I kind of keep going back to that. Um, it, you know, all these beers have have a more of a bitter backbone than we've been used to, and so this one is is more bitter and less fragrant mm-hmm. than than I would have expected. Yeah, I can see the juicy fruit in there. It is it is fruity. Um it's not like overly um citrusy, I don't no. think. It's more of kind of a soft fruit kind of a thing going on. Yep. It's kind of that peaches and mango and um mm. just ripe you know, ripe melon maybe. 
yeah a little bit yeah so do you want to read the first what's the first uh, time yeah. wait okay. i stole these from hopslist.com and i've kept them on a mayonnaise jar <laughs> and fucking wagnall's porch <laughs> since noon on wednesday <laughs> Daring do. Daring do. How do you tell if you've had some darings in your yard? <laughs> okay. <laughs> what, what, what is the first hop on the list? Matoika. Gesundheit. I think that's how you pronounce it, but I don't know. That's how I say it. Matoika. Someone correct me. <laughs> as I'm sure you will. Formerly known as Belgian sots or B sots. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that his I first heard, ra- first had his first rap album. That, well, I heard a woman on the street call her uh, girlfriend. They were in a fight. She says, "You b sots." <laughs> it's like, hold on, girl, don't you go there. Two snaps in a circle. Two snaps in a circle. Hated it. <laughs> Matoika is a premier New Zealand hop developed by Hort Research. Thought that was a long German word for a minute. Hort Research. This triploid. Triploid was bred from Sots and an unnamed New Zealand breeding strain and lends itself well to lagers, pilsners, and Belgian ales. Mm. It makes an excellent dual-purpose hop, carrying an exciting fruit aroma with refreshing notes of tropical fruit and citrus. It can be used at any point during the brewing process and works well in sweet, malty, and fruity beers. Massachusetts brewmaster Jack... Jack uses... (laughs) We just know him by Jack. We just know him as <laughs> just Jack. Uh, uses Matoika in a Maybach, and Sierra Nevada Brewery also debuted their Southern Hemisphere Harvest Fresh Hops in April 2014, using Matoika along with Southern Cross as its finishing hop. Okay, Southern Cross. Yeah, get it. I was thinking Southern Cross might be another brewery. It's a hop. Uh, so, okay, so fruity, uh, and that's exactly how I think of it as kind of malty, sweet, Mm. Fruity style beers. Cool. Motoika. Motoika. That's right. Maybe that's a Maori word. Maybe. I think so. Yeah. Uh, as is probably Rakao. All right. So that's okay. the first hop and the first beer, maybe unrelated. <laughs> this exactly. is this is the uh, the second uh, the second beer we're tasting now. Mm. Mm. Number two. Oh my. That's that's a lot more present. Mm-hmm. There's a lot more fruit there. Yeah, boy, there's a lot. It's a big. It's a much bigger. As these beers have warmed up, and maybe maybe as my my tongue has become uninfluenced by the two hearted ale clone that we <laughs> <laughs> that we drank before we started drinking these. Uh, boy, that is big and juicy and that's pretty. actually pretty good. Yeah. I, I like that one. Um, and yeah, it's just over the top. And you're right, as it warmed up some. Mm becoming much more fragrant and i'm not getting the plasticky off flavors i don't know maybe i'm just maybe it's these dollar general <laughs> cups we got <laughs> they were on <laughs> sale <laughs> and they were in the bargain bin <laughs> they might have been used before i'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> get one free with every half pint of pop off <laughs> there was a cigarette button one of them <laughs> <laughs> was it lucky <laughs> not for me okay <laughs> oh well wait a minute there's a Mm. Bigger, fruitier. Mm-hmm. Um, still not like a citrus bomb. Still not like grapefruit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but big. Maybe. Ch- I was going to say cherry. Yeah, cherry or just kind of a stone fruit yeah. thing going on there. Yeah. Um, it's actually pretty good. Yeah. I, I like that actually. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Okay, so hop, hop number two. <clears throat> Rakao. Gesundheit. Rakao Welch was one of my favorite. <laughs> when I was a boy, all the stories I could tell. <laughs> but I won't. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Rakao, or Alpha Aroma. That's what oh. she drove, you know, was an Alpha Aroma. <laughs> one, of those, one of those Italian movies. <laughs> <laughs> Raquel Welch was driving around in an Alfa Romero. <laughs> she br- drove under a Lola Brid- Lola de- Lola. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> okay, Lola Labrigida. Lola Labrigida. Um, Raquel or Alf Aroma, as it Alf Aroma, 
Has it, sounds like bad spaghetti. That's, that's when you know Alpha's been in your yard. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Alpha aroma. Ooh. How strong was that too hard today? Um, Alpha aroma, as it was previously known, was developed in New Zealand, languishing in its disease free habitat. <laughs> That's literally the sentence that's written here. I'm sorry. I hope you copied and pasted this. I did. Okay, because if you wrote this copy, you're in trouble. <laughs> Languishing in... Next a, time I'm going to sneak stuff in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, that's a comma. Languishing in its disease-free habitat, Raquel features a high concentration of myrcene. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Myrcene is said to pair it beautifully to dry-hopped American pale ales. Mm. Okay. It is an, It was initially bred in the late 1970s from Smooth Cone. I loved his first album. From Smooth Cone, although open pollination, through, through open pollination, but it was not released to the market until 1983. It was re-released under the new name in 2007. According to New Zealand Hops Limited, Alf Aroma, wow, that's hard to say, Alf Aroma no longer exists as a commercially named variety. Despite that, it is currently being grown and sold under its old name by Duchess Hops of New York, who planted it in the U.S. in 2013. Ah. So if you get Alfa Roma, it's, it comes from New York. <clears throat> yeah. I've never seen Alfa Roma. I've never heard of it. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. So so what are the adjectives that uh, that we're looking for for Raquel? Uh, gosh, you know what? <laughs> it doesn't really give any. It doesn't talk about its, it's It was languishing profile. in a disease-free habitat. Yeah. Uh, it requires high concentration, features a high concentration of myrcene, and is said to pair beautifully to dry-hopped American pale ales. Okay. Well, that's, that's it. That's, that's not much help. help. Maybe I should proofread things instead of just copying and pasting. <laughs> you were languishing in a disease-free was, environment, yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> for, for the moment. <laughs> okay. All right. This is number beer number a three. You're drinking it there. There you go. Okay. Mmm. Mmm. Oh, that's tasty. Oh my. You know, I'm becoming less. Um, I was pretty off put by these beers at first. They like like oh, what's, what went wrong? These are pretty good. Yeah. They just needed to warm some. Or we just needed to drink more. Well, that could be too. <laughs> Instead of beer goggles, we have beer taste buds. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> But we're not. We haven't had that much to drink. No. This is this to me is uh, grapey. Yeah. Oh yeah. I don't mean to lead you. You're. I'm right there with you, trooper. <laughs> but it has also um, a good bitterness backbone as well. Yeah, it's kind of. Um... There's a little bit of dark spice in it. Hmm. Um, I don't know what else to say about it. It definitely reminds me of wine, and it yeah yeah yeah. So that's interesting. I hope we're not wrong because it because that sure is <laughs> that's sure where I'm getting going. Well, the none of these is like a big juicy mm-hmm. grapefruity citrusy American hop. No, not at all. And um, and by the same token, they're also not that kind of floral, mm-hmm. um, herbal, you're, you're, n- noble hop yeah, either. Yeah. They're they are they are different altogether, mm-hmm. and that would make sense. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. I just had an epiphany. Yeah, I'm I'm feeling better about this round. I thought I thought that this was good. <clears throat> Pardon me. I thought that this was going to be in in the scrapyard of. <laughs> I mean, I was going to air the show, but I was going to be like apologizing for it to be a complete loss. But this is not. I, th- I no. think that That's maybe our taste buds are. No, I, th- I I have confidence in our taste buds. I do too, and I I just think I you know when you first poured them, they were very cold, mm-hmm. and we had come off of drinking that um, two hearted yeah, clone, yeah, very fresh Centennial hops, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and they were very very fizzy. No head, yeah. but they were very, very fizzy, and that's why we had the yeah. discussion about contamination or whatever. They've settled out now. The flavor is 
the malt is coming through in a nicer way, and they're mm-hmm. it's playing better with the hops. They were just too damn cold and fizzy. And I think yeah. fi- fizz uh, mm-hmm. can can have a bitter, yeah, you know, acidic kind of character to it. Yeah. So now that they've had some time to breathe, I'm a lot happier with them. Um, and what's your what's your impression of the of the malt character now that they've settled down? Well, it's it, it it's a little bit caramelly as you would expect with Vienna malt. Um, it's actually it's actually nice. I, I actually actually like it. Um, you know, it, it's not as it, it's not you know Vienna is a is a good specialty malt in the U.S. But you know, I've brewed a lot of beers with just Vienna as the base malt, and then a little bit of other specialty malt in it. And um, and I've always been real happy with the results. This is a little bit caramelly, a little bit um, toasty, mm-hmm. and um, so other than that, you know, it's it's a pale malt. I th- well, I think I think Vienna is excellent for like a malty lager. Mm-hmm. You know, and maybe it just doesn't pair as well with you know hot, these really fruity hop forward beers. Well, that could be. That's that's absolutely a, that's a good hypothesis. <laughs> <Goes in tight. laughs> okay, so did we do okay, the we third hop? We need to finish out with the hop descriptions. This is Charles Nelson Savon Riley. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Okay, Nelson Savon or Savin. Nelson Savin's name is derived from the Sauvignon Blanc wine grape to which many agree has similar flavor and aroma characteristics. Developed in New Zealand and released in the year 2000, it is considered too wild for many major brewers. Wow. Huh. Let me say that again. That's, it is considered too wild for many major brewers. Despite this, Nelson Savon has found significant use among craft breweries and home brewers for its eccentric characteristics. The variety has gained popularity in American-style pale ales, but is definitely a hop that requires prudent and discerning application in brewing. Nelson Savin's oil profile is complex and fortunately works well as an aroma hop, flavor hop, and also for bittering. Low cohumul... Oh, God, I can never say this. <laughs> Cohumulone... Yes. Yes, is responsible for its smooth, bittering qualities. It is descended from smooth cone, huh? huh. Just as, as uh, was Raquel. Yeah, there you go. Very interesting. Well, that's I, I have brewed with this before, but not a lot, so I don't have a lot of experience with it. But, but uh, yeah, so I think I think one of them is the Nelson Savant because yeah. I yeah. definitely get a strong <laughs> wine yeah. character from it. Yeah. Okay, so now I we have I'm gonna I think we have the bittering numbers here. Nice. I think we should we should make our guesses first, and then okay. and then I'll see if we can figure out. Or should we should we try to figure out which one we think? Well, let's just go ahead and do this way. Okay. Uh, and then uh, I I have an advantage because I know which one is the most bitter. Um, oh, okay. Um, so, okay. Final tasting. Yeah, final tasting. Hmm. These actually are tasting pretty good now. Number one is delicious. Okay. Hmm. Okay. All right. So, what what do you think number one is? I think number one is Raquel. Okay. I think it's a toss up. <laughs> I'm just just for just for argument's sake, I'm gonna say it's Motueka. Okay. And number two? For argument's sake, I'm gonna say that's Motoika. Okay, and then I'm gonna say that's Rakao. Okay. I think we're both agreed that number three is Nelson Savin, right? Yes, number yeah, three well, I, obviously I think is Nelson Savin. Okay, so why don't you open okay. uh, un- unmask number three first? Oh by the way, we've been tasting these blind. I didn't say that, I don't think. Yeah. What's number three? Nelson Savin. Nelson Savin. Yay! Yay! We re- we I really did get that grapey characteristic. Yeah, it came through very strong. Yeah. And while I think that's pretty good, I would like to... Now I want to play with that beer in a really light, crisp, Saison-style beer. Oh, yeah. I think it would be delicious. Yeah. Number two is... Motueka. Motueka. 
What did I say? You said it was Raquel. Okay, you got it. I got it. You I got, got all three, three right. Holy woo! High five. Did I win the new seasonal sectional? <laughs> the, one, the one from Lazy Boy? You got you got that freestanding uh, metal enameled uh, fireplace. <laughs> Remember those from like, yeah. Wheel of Fortune? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> wow! Congratulations. That's a first. We, on the on the hop sampler, you got all, all, I got all three, three right. right. Wow! Woo-hoo. All right, now, all right, now you get to go to the bonus round. Okay, because this is where I get that oven heat. The, <laughs> <laughs> if you can't afford real heat, you get oven heat. I don't know, you know what I'm saying. No. <laughs> okay, now. Okay, this is interesting because one hop. One of these beer, one of these beers. Even though I used math and the alpha acid numbers and stuff to try to get these as close as possible, okay. one of these beers measured at fifty-six point eight IBUs, thanks okay. to thanks to the lab at at Bell's Brewery. Uh, this these are official. This is official science. Okay, one of them measured out at fifty-six point eight. IBUs, another one 37.4, the other one 38.1. Wow. So one is, is not twice as much, but significantly measured more bitter than the other two. So which one, can you pick out one that's, that's and I don't, I'm not sure that I could have done this, but can you pick out one that is significantly more bitter than the other two? I think I can. <laughs> Said the little engine that could. That's right. <laughs> the little lush that could. <laughs> I, I think number one is the most bitter. The Rakao. No, number one is the Rakao. Yeah. The Rakao weighed in at 38.1. Oh. Well. 38.1. Okay. So, All right. Um, so it's between the Motueka and the Nelson. Then I'd say it's the Motueka. And the Motueka weighed in at 37.4. Are you me? <laughs> <laughs> really? You censured yourself. That's good. I. They don't taste that way to me at all. That is crazy. You're holding the paper there in front of you. The Nelson Savant tastes absolutely the least bitter to me. Wow, really? Yeah. To my palate, that just blows everything out of the water for me. I don't get anywhere near the bittering in my palate. That's crazy. Now this is <clears throat> very interesting because... We spend so much time just fixated on IBUs Mm -hmm. and predicting IBUs and calculating IBUs and all that stuff. And if these lab results are correct, and I can't... I mean, these these people do this for a living. So do we. (laughs) Well... Not not in the same way. But they know what they're doing. (laughs) They got that going for them, but... Well, what they, else? They wear lab coats and hair nets, maybe. Oh yeah. <laughs> but can you? Be, that's I'm that's stunned. crazy. I'm stunned. The the Raquel tastes the most bitter to me. It has that back of the throat thing. Maybe what I'm, maybe the flavor I'm describing or the sensation I'm describing isn't bitterness at all. Mm. At some level, maybe what I'm equating with true bitterness isn't and let me i'm going to walk over here and get another piece of paper okay. because uh you know we we have computers so we're living in a paperless world yes. now remember when we tasted the amarillo the falconer's flight and the willamette yeah the we the bitterness bitterness level we thought was pretty much the same yeah well, Amit weighed in at 31.1, Falconer's Flight at 34.4, Amarillo at 42.5. That's significant. It makes me wonder how uh, how really sensitive to the differences. In other words, maybe 10 
even 15 bittering units isn't enough mm-hmm. for at least my palate right. to to distinguish a whole lot. I, I'm, I'm surprised, but, you know, it is kind of maybe another way to say it. You know, when you see a chart that works in tenths of a point and it goes straight up, and you think, well, that's really something. <laughs> but if you convert that into a whole number, it's like it barely moved. And it, it might be that our palates aren't really sensitive to within five or six or seven IBUs that, that we can't tell, and that there are other things at play. Or, or even 20. Even 20. It, but that also that the bitterness, the measured bitterness, isn't the whole story in the perceived bitterness. I See, mean, I'm, I'm I mean, rationalizing I mean, this like crazy, I yeah. know. Well, but, obviously, I think if you, if you have a, like a Hellas lager... Mm-hmm. at 20 IBUs. Yep. And then you have an American Pale Ale at 70. Right. Yeah, you're going to taste that. Yeah, you're going to taste it. But also, if the beer is in balance with itself, mm-hmm. that makes a huge difference in the perceived bitterness. Right. So uh, my wife, who's not particularly a beer drinker, she likes beer, but she doesn't drink it. But um, I've given her beers that were, at least on paper, you know, in the 75, 80... She said, "Oh my God, this is so good!" And they don't the perceived bitterness right. in there because they're in balance. Right. So it it might be that we're also sensitive to that every bit as much. And just like you say, if you made a if we made a a, a German wheat beer that's supposed to be thirteen or fifteen IBUs, but we made forty IBUs, it wouldn't be in balance. It right. wouldn't taste right. It would right. taste very bitter. Right. Yeah. I feel really good about this episode. I think we, <laughs> we it's a lot to chew on. Uh, you know, number one, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to use my brand new gear from Steve's brew Uh, so that, uh, we, you know, we get back to having some foam on our, on our beers in these experiments. Uh, but then I think we, I think we need to read, redo these hops with the, with the, uh, Pilsen or Pilsner light malt extract yeah. to see if we, if it's any different. Yeah. But then uh, maybe we don't worry so much about the IBUs. Well, they are just a guideline. I mean, really. Um, and we all talk about them. But again, it's a little bit like the HSBU. Right. It's your palate. Mm-hmm. And I have this conversation almost every day with a customer, with some customer. Uh, the person will come in the door. They'll say, I want a beer that's not too bitter. And I'll say, well, what do you drink? And they'll drink a beer that I think is relatively bitter. And I say, well, what does that mean? What do you, you know? And so if you've never, if you don't have anything to compare it to, in other words, you haven't sat down and had a glass of beer together Mm -hmm. and agreed upon what's bitter or not, it's a very difficult discussion to have. Mm -hmm. If I'm talking with an experienced home brewer, I can say something like, well, this is a, a German wheat beer and it has... 15 IBUs. And we both have a sense of what that means. But, um, wow, this is kind of, this is crazy because I expected to be able to pick out the bitter beer yeah. pretty easy. Yeah. yeah. Really, really pretty stunned at that. Me too. All right. To be continued. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, James. Once again, thanks to Steve. Uh, and we are thinking of our friends in New Zealand as they work through some painful times down there. Uh, on a lighter note, Hop Sampler 9 is in the fermenter with Galena, Denali, and El Dorado. Or as we say around here in Arkansas, El Dorado. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form at basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check all those out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. Get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo, and you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store, too. You can find our log books, where you can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. Check all those out at basicbrewingshop.com. Also, take a look at our silicone pints while you're there. 
So until next time, until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. Thank you.